Let's pray. Father, to you alone will we extol your name and your glory. Every day, may we bless you and praise you forever and ever because great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. Lord, may one generation commend your works to another. Let those who have partaken and and experienced your grace that we would declare your mighty acts. Let us speak of your awesome deeds. Let us pour forth with abundant gratitude and thanksgiving praises to your name. Because the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all and his mercy is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power, and that we would make known to our children the mighty deeds and the glory splendor of your kingdom, the everlasting kingdom, because the Lord is faithful in all his words and is kind in all his works. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who bow down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them food in due season. Father, you open your hand. You satisfy the desire of every living thing. For you are righteous in all your ways and kind in all your works. Let us not forget, Lord, that you are near to all who call upon your name, to all who call on you in truth. May our mouths speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless your holy name forever and ever. Amen. I was contemplating titling, uh, instead of using the word hope in the title for the sermon, I thought about using the word trust, but I felt that the word hope did a better job of kind of encapsulating this deep, rich truth, because uh, hope can be used as a noun, it could be a subject that, that, we're, that we're putting our hope in, but it can also be used as, as a verb to describe hoping, sh- striving, yearning for. I think hope is a better term because it, it stirs within us a fortitude to, to move forward when we are facing trials or, or painful circumstances. So, so my charge for us this morning as a church is to hope in Yahweh. Hope in the Lord God. And by hope, I I mean a favorable, confident expectation that God will do, has done, and will continue to do mighty things for His people. We have hope in God because He is faithful to His Word and to His character We have hope in God because He is immutable. He he doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if you don't remember anything else that I say for the rest of this morning, I pray that you would remember this. Hope in Yahweh because all other hopes will eventually fail you. Hope in God because everything else is hopeless. It's the overarching theme for for what we're going to be looking at today as we come to 1 Samuel chapter 26. It's the third part of a triad of chapters that that God is staying or or holding back the hand of David from, from killing somebody. Chapter 25, there's the foolish man Nabal, and he he's on on the way to to destroy Nabal and his house. 
And God sovereignly, providentially works through Abigail to, to calm him, to stay his hand, to put his trust back in the Lord. And then chapter 24, if you remember, he's in a cave and King Saul, who is pursuing him out to seek his life, goes into the cave to relieve himself. David has the opportunity to sneak up on him and take Saul's life. And so we have a very similar situation, chapter 26, 1 Samuel. Then the Zephites came to Saul at Gebeah, saying, Is not David hiding himself on the hill of Hakaliah, which is east of Jeshurun? So Saul rose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph with 3,000 chosen men of Israel to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul encamped at the hill of Hakaliah, which is besides the road east of Jeshimon. But David remained in the wilderness. When he saw that Saul came after him into the wilderness, David sent out spies and learned that Saul was indeed come. Then David rose and came to a place where Saul had encamped, and David saw the place where Saul lie, and Abner the son of Ner, the commander of his army. Saul was lying within the encampment with his army encamped around him. Just explain here a couple things. If you remember, if you have really good memory, or maybe you have a footnote in your Bible, the Zephites are actually relatives to David. They're cousins. They are in a certain region. They were the ones who informed King Saul the first time a couple chapters back that David was in hiding. And remember, Saul came down there, couldn't find him. Maybe now they think, hey, here's another opportunity. We can get on the good side of King Saul. And he tells him, Saul gathers a thousand, excuse me, 3,000 chosen men. He's basically taking the elite soldiers that he has to go find David once again. I do also want to remind us all, the last time Saul was on the scene here in the Bible in chapter, what was it, 24, he had promised David that he would no longer pursue him. Saul, obviously not a man of his word. Verse 6, then David said to Ahimelech the Hittite and to Joab's brother Abishia, the son of Zeruah, who will go down with me to the camp of Saul? And Abishia said, I will go down with you. So, da- so David and Abishia went down to the army by night, and there lay Saul sleeping within his encampment with his spear stuck in the ground at his head, and Abner and the army lay around him. Then Abishia said to David, God has given your enemy into your hand this day. Now please let me pin him to the earth with one stroke of the spear. And I will not strike him twice. But David said to Abishia, do not destroy him. For who can put their hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? And David said, as the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him, or his day will come to die, or he will go go down into battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should put my hand out against the Lord's anointed. But take now the spear that is at his head and the jar of water and let us go. So David took the spear and the jar of water from Saul's head and they went away. No man saw it or knew it, nor did any awake, for they were all asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen upon them. Just want to note here a few things. Abishia is actually David's nephew. As you'll find out later on, uh, Zeruah is, is David's sister. Abishi and has, some, has two other brothers, and they are always thirsty for blood. As you'll see a little bit in 2 Samuel, and if you read Chronicles, they always are. There's later in Chronicles where David just kind of steps back and says, I can't have any more to do with you because they were always out for blood. Verse 13, Then David went over to the other side and stood far off on the top of a hill with a great space between them. And David called to the army and to Abner, the son of Ner, saying, Will you not answer, Abner? And then Abner answered, Who are you who calls to the Lord? excuse me, calls to the king. And David said to Abner, Are you not a man who is like you in Israel? Why then have you not kept watch over the Lord your king? 
for one of the people came in to destroy the king your Lord. This thing that you have done is not good. As the Lord lives, you deserve to die because you have not kept watch over your Lord, the Lord's anointed. And now see where the king's spear is and the jar of water that was at his head. Saul, recognizing David's voice, and said, Is this your voice, my son David? And David said, It is my voice, my lord, O king. And he said, Why does my lord pursue after his servant? For what have I done? What evil is on my hands? Now, therefore, let the lord, the king, hear the words of his servant. If it is the lord who has stirred you up against me, may he accept an offering. But if it is man... May they be cursed before the Lord, for they have driven me out of this day that I should have no share in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, Go serve other gods. Now, therefore, let not my blood fall to the earth away from the presence of the Lord, for the king of Israel has come out to seek a single flea, like one who hunts a partridge in the mountains. Let me explain here a few things. David has crept in. He has taken the the spear and the water bottle, the the canteen of King Saul. He has snuck back out. The reason they were able to do this, it says, God has put these people to sleep. There's a deep sleep on them. Maybe that's why they can whisper and have a conversation and nobody wakes up. He goes out. He is wise. He goes up to a, a mountainside. There's some gap there, so that way if he sees that the army is starting to be roused to come after him, he's got a little bit of a head start. He stands up there, holds the spear, calls out to Abner. Abner is the head of the army. He's, he's the commander. His job was to be the protector of the king, and he fell asleep, and no one was awake. And he calls him out and says, aren't you, aren't you a man? What he's saying there is, aren't you like a man above men? Aren't you the one who's in charge? You should be put to death because you haven't done what you were commanded to do. And then King, De- uh, King Saul calls him out. And notice he calls him his son again. Is that you, my son? And David says, why do you continue to pursue me? If the Lord has, has, has called you to do that, let me know because then I can offer sacrifice. I can seek forgiveness. David knows he hasn't done that, but he's saying if there is grounds, let me know. Don't let this continue. But then look here at verse 21. Look at what, how this conversation ends. Then Saul said, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for for I will no more do you harm because my life was precious in your eyes this day. Behold, I have acted foolishly and have made a great mistake. And David answered and said, Here is the spear, O king. Let one of your young men come over and take it. The Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord gave you into my hand today, and I would not put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. Behold, as your life was precious this day in my sight, so may my life be precious in the sight of the Lord. And may he deliver me out of all tribulation. Then Saul said to David, Blessed be you, my son David. You will do many things, and you will succeed in them. So David went his way, and Saul returned to his palace. So even though again Saul says, I've sinned, I've done wrong, forgive me, thank you for for sparing my life. David, maybe with some wisdom, decides I'm still not coming home. I'm going to continue to stay out in the wilderness, find a safe place until God finally puts me in the position I can be in. So there's our our chapter that we're looking at here. And again, like I said, the, the focus, the overarching theme here is to hope in Yahweh. Because I pray that as as you read through that chapter you were seeing here, David has opportunities to do something, and he chooses not to because he's hoping in the Lord. So church, let us never forget this. God is sovereign. 
even over our enemies. When, when clear minds prevail, we might contemplate this reality, and it should grant us peace. When we can remind ourselves, when we feel like we're being attacked by people, when we feel like we're being attacked by the very world itself, this truth, if we could just resuscitate it back into our minds, bring it back to life, we can have that, I'm okay because God is actually still reigning over all things. Do we believe this truth? Do we believe that God is sovereign? Is He reigning in control over all things, even our enemies? Our responses to situations is a good window into our heart to see if we actually believe it. Because when situations start to, to come against us, trials, tribulations, attacks from people, do we respond in anger? Do we panic? Do we run and flee from the situation? Are we patient? Do we have calm words instead of spiteful ones? Those reveal what's actually happening in our heart. Can we trust God? It's easy to shake our head and say, yes, I trust him. Yes, he's in control. Yes, I know he's working for my good in all circumstances. Yes, 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 yes. But in the real world, when we actually have to do something, do we respond in a way that says, God is in control? Or do we hope we can get things in control? Do we trust God's justice? Do we trust God in his timing? Do we trust God's ways? I think it's interesting. We, we have this, this man, Abiyashia, who volunteers to go with David under the cover of darkness into the center of a camp with 3,000 soldiers. Two guys versus 3,000 guys. Why? Why volunteer for that? I think in the back of his mind, he's thinking him and David will be this awesome, small, tactical team. They're going to tiptoe in there, and they're going to stealthily sneak up on the sleeping king, and he's going to have the privilege of being part of the party that actually finally puts to death King Saul. His name will be remembered forever and ever in the annals of history. And there they are, standing over sleeping Saul. And I, I love his word, wording to David. He says to David, God has given you your enemy into your hands. And then he says to this, let me take his spear and pierce him. I will only need one stroke. And I think what he's trying to do is allude to the fact that, hey, remember this guy has thrown the spear at you multiple times, David, and missed so maybe trying to stir that anger in David or, or whatnot. Maybe you've had a friend do that to you or, or, or somebody else remind you. Remember what this person did to you and what does that normally do? It stirs that fire in you like, yeah, we need to get them. Let me pin him to the earth with, with one stroke. But what does David do? Why doesn't he say, go for it? That's why we're here. Is this not the reason they entered the camp? Why put yourself in such a difficult situation, such, such a, a dangerous one? But look at the response that he gives. And it had to almost like confound his nephew. David is basically saying to, to Abishia, the problem of Saul, the problem of our enemy, has already been solved. The problem's gone. It's been dealt with. You can almost imagine the look like, wait, what? He's right here. He's still alive. How is the problem solved? We're walking away, not dealing with this problem? Are you crazy? 
But it seems like David actually learned his lesson this time. Because if you remember back from the previous chapter, he was set to destroy Nabal, a fool. And he is, he is stopped by Abigail who reminds him, God is in control. God's going to take care of this. You don't have to bloody your hands with this circumstance. God has already given you a promise. You will be king. You don't have to take it in your own control to do it. Yahweh will handle Saul's destiny. It wasn't his responsibility to take Saul's life. And so I come to our own hearts. Christian, do we struggle with this? Do you see a situation and you, you, you want to take responsibility for it because you know how it should play out? You know what should happen. You know what should be said. You know what should be done. And, and you're ready to do it now. You don't want to wait. You will take justice in your own hands. You will define how the solution should manifest itself. Maybe it's just me who struggles with that. But look here again, look here again at, at, at what David whispers. He says this, verse 9, Do not destroy him, for who can put out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? And David said, As the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him on his day. Or his day will, will come to die, or he will go down into battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. Look at what he said here. He's like, we're not called to do this. We're going to trust God. When is it going to happen? I don't know. Maybe it will happen 10 days from now. That's what happened with Nabal. Maybe it will happen 10 years from now. I, I don't know, but I know that, that it will happen because God has made a promise, so I'm going to trust that he will do it. Why? Because God is in control. David's hope is in God, not in his ability to kill Saul. David's hope is in the Lord's justice, not the one he wants to enact. It is God who will value David's life. I think that is a huge problem when it comes to trusting that God is in control. We think God doesn't love us. We think God doesn't value us. Or we think by doing something, we will raise the value of our own name by our own power, by our own acts, by our own intellect. And what we are actually doing is diminishing the name of God. What would it be like if these words of David were, were stretched out over all of our life? Would we grasp for control? Might we sleep better? Maybe we'll have lower blood pressure. Maybe we would actually be free to do things because we're trusting that God is the one who will work and move for our behalf. It's far too easy to affirm that God is sovereign, that he's in control, even over our enemies, to shake our heads and say yes. It is far too easy to do that. It is much harder to actually put it into practice in our life. Beloved, every person, that includes you, every person is under the sovereign reign of God. David would write in Psalm 135, Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all the depths. Job 42, verse 2, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. The writer of Proverbs tells us, the heart of man plans his ways, but the Lord establishes his steps. He would also write, the Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. 
The prophet Isaiah speaking, the words of the Lord says, For I am God and there is no other. I am God, there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times things yet not done, saying, My counsel shall stand. I will accomplish my purposes. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 6. O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might, so that none is able to withstand you. And then Paul writes in Colossians chapter 1, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He has numbered the amount of pulses our heart will take. He has established the volume of breaths our lungs will inhale. Nothing is outside of his authority. That's in good times and in bad times. There's hope in this truth that God is sovereign over all things, even our enemies, because when we face enemies, when we face pain, when we face trials, God can or could have stopped all of those things from entering our lives, yet he is sovereign, and in his wisdom he has chosen not to. Why? Because it's for our good. And it's for his glory. Well, Pastor, that doesn't sound like good news. Good news is when all my enemies are defeated. Good news is when all the pain has gone away. Good news is when all trials and tribulations have subsided. But when all those things have happened, who do we worship? Who do we pursue? Probably ourselves. Or maybe we just sit back and don't do anything. There's peace and hope knowing that God is in control. There's peace and hope for David knowing that Saul is on the throne only because God has allowed him to be. The universe isn't spiraling out of control. God is still sovereign. He will do it in his time, in his ways. I don't have to force his hand. Not that he could. Christian, your enemy... Your tribulation is not outside of the hand of God. Oh, what good, good news that is. My mentor, Pastor Steve Clark, would say this. The hardest thing to believe amidst suffering is that God who reigns is a God of love. And the most glorious thing to believe amidst suffering is that the God who reigns is a God of love. Are you placing your hope in Yahweh, knowing that he's sovereign over all circumstances and situations? Are you placing your hope in him or in something else? There is something so countercultural if we, we, we would put ourselves in his hands, trusting him amidst all odds. Yet there's also something freeing if we do that. We are freed to love when we trust that God is in control. Church. Hope in Yahweh and love your enemy. Hope in God. Rest in that and love your enemy. Presented in this chapter is David's second opportunity he has to kill Saul. He has it again. He could have snuck up in the cave in Engedi. He, he cuts off a piece of his robe to prove to Saul, see, I could have taken your life. His men told him, God has delivered him into your hands. Take his life. Here he is again. He's, he's creeping in there with his nephew, and his nephew's like, yes, I'm going to get to stab Saul in the heart. And David says, no. 
Surely God had delivered Saul into his hand. Surely this was the opportunity. But what are David's words to Saul? What are David's words to the man who has been pursuing him for years? I know it's only been a couple weeks that Saul's been in the wilderness, but this is, this is over a, a span of years. What are those words to the man who, 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 who threw a spear at him multiple times, hoping to pin him to the wall? What are his words to the king who literally sent the entire army of Israel after him? Go back a couple chapters, you'll see that. What are his words to the father-in-law that says, I promise I'm not going to kill you. And then here we are two chapters later, he's trying to kill him again. What are his words to the man who has driven him away from his, from his house and his home, has driven him to the point where he, he literally feels like, there's no place for me in Israel. I, I'm an Israelite and I can't even be in my, the place that God has given me, the, 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 the blessed inheritance. How does David respond to this man? with words dripping with grace and love. I'm amazed at David's words in, in chapter, excuse me, verse 22. He, he stands on this hillside. I picture that he raises the spear over his head, and he says, here's your spear, O king. Let one of your young men come back and get it. That is ridiculous to me. Because if I was David, I would say, here's your spear, the symbol of your power, your authority. Crack it over my knee and be able to throw it on the ground and say, ah, I'm the one with power. Could have killed you, but I didn't. The very weapon that had been hurled at him, he gives back to him. Have you ever been that stupid? You know, your, your kid is throwing stuff, you know, especially when they're on the floor. I love new parents. You know, old parents know, like, you threw it on the floor, I'm not picking it up again. New parents, kid throws the fork on the floor, picks it up. Kid throws the fork on the floor, picks it up. Kid throws the fork on the floor, picks it up. And then goes up, throws the bowl on the floor, picks it up. You know, parents who've been there a while, you're like, Psh, you're not eating. That's all right. And you're going to stay in that high chair for the rest of your life. Why? Because, you, 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 like, how idiotic would that be? Here, you tried to kill me with it. Take it back. Here, the, the, the sign of your, your power and authority, which you are so corrupt in using, I'm going to give back to you. It's amazing because David is protecting his enemy against retaliation from someone who sides with him. I know I couldn't do that, at least not on my own ability, not in my own desire, not in my own intellect. I could only do that if I actually trusted that God was in control. In many ways, what you have here is a beautiful, gracious picture of David turning the other cheek. He is forgiving Saul his murderous enemy, again. Man, that sounds like another David. That sounds like one greater than David. A son of David who, who wouldn't just merely spare the life of his enemy, but would actually give his own life to completely save and redeem the lives of his enemies. Even those who sought to harm him, even those who cared nothing for him, even those who, who once despised him and, and, and still often battle with, with the temptation and desire to dethrone him from their own heart, he has forgiven them, he has saved them, he has redeemed them with what? The perfect sacrifice of his own life. That is ridiculous when you think about it. Church, Jesus has done you good even when you have done evil to him. He has repaid our evil with good and perfect righteousness. We have 
slapped him in the face. We have spit in his eye again and again and again and again. And even though you profess to be a Christian, and even though you really are a Christian, you still battle sin and you sin again and again and again. And what does he do? He turns the other cheek and he forgives us. Why? Do you contemplate that? Do you, do, you, do you let that sit on you? I mean, like, how in the world would you do that? I can't do that. You can't do that. Other people haven't done that for me. Why would you do that? You are perfect. You are holy. You are righteous. You have every right to destroy every person who has ever breathed a single breath. But instead, what? You love us? That doesn't make any sense. I mean, I know who I am. I, I, I know who, what I've done. After all of this, I, I continue to do this, and your response to me is, I love you. Jesus' own words echo the words of David from verse 24. Because Jesus, when he looks at you, Christian, Jesus, when he thinks of you, Christian, can say, Behold, your life was precious this day in my sight. Do we get what that means? Your life was precious in my sight. My messed up, broken, garbage-filled life, precious. If you can't rest there, I pray for you. Because when you experience that, it does something to your heart. It, it changes who you are and the desires of his people. It transforms our hearts. We, we, we react and we interact with people differently. We can turn the other cheek instead of retaliating. Why? Because our hope isn't in obtaining the things of this world. We can forgive 70 times 7 times. Why? Because the infinite holy God has forgiven me. Who am I not to follow suit? We can do something so counterculture, so opposite mankind's innate nature that the world will look at us loving our enemy and stop in awe and say, how, why do you do that? And your response is because my Savior sought to bless me even when I was his enemy. I want to bless them so that they would know my Savior. Brothers and sisters, are you actively seeking the good of your enemy? Please make sure, let me, let me make sure you understand what I'm saying here. Do you seek to bless and do good to your enemy? The only way you can do that is if you actually believe and rest and hope in the reality that God is sovereign over all all things. Because if I can trust him, then I'm free to love, even when circumstances don't seem to be going the way that I want them to go. Oh, that we would grasp and delight in the reality of what God has done for us and that he is sovereign and that though we were once called enemies, we are now beloved sons and daughters with a beautiful inheritance, Christ. When God is your everything, you can joyfully love your enemy. When God is in control, and even in the bad times you know that he is using them for your good, you are free to love in a way that the world can't comprehend. And sometimes in ways you can't comprehend. Church, trust that he is good and hope in God and find your life changed forever 
so that you will love in a way that was incomprehensible before but is now the way you respond because you have experienced love that you can't even fathom. How do we do that? We go to the cross again and again. We remind ourselves that he is hanging on that cross because of me. And why is he hanging there? Because he loved before I loved him. When you think there, you rest. You walk away somber, but yet you also walk away rejoicing, singing his praises and saying, God has done a mighty thing. I don't have to save myself because I can't. And now I can love in ways I never thought I could love before. Church, hope in God and love the way God loved you. Let's pray.